I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG. I also serve in a leadership role with the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, or GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at unprecedented scale and speed. This is being done by providing a coordinated and holistic approach to the necessary knowledge, education, and support to power system operators across the five action pillars. The foundation of the GPST is a group of six system operators from around the globe who are facing higher penetration of wind and solar inverter-based resources sooner than any other operators in the world. The five pillars of the consortium are research and peer learning, technical support, workforce development, technology adoption support, and open data and tools. ESIG is the lead on Pillar 1, and more information on the GPST can be found at globalpst.org. As the lead on Pillar 1, ESIG would like to welcome you to the third webinar of our 2022 monthly joint GPST Pillar 1 ESIG webinar series. This series is in addition to the regular ESIG monthly webinar series and focuses on the GPST research agenda and associated topics being addressed in Pillar 1. Topics are presented by both the founding system operators and other advanced system operators active in Pillar 1, as well as members of industry and academia participating in the activities of the research agenda group and the research advisory committee of Pillar 1. An additional series of webinars on the other four pillars of the GPST is also being provided on a monthly basis through NREL. For those of you who would like to learn more about GPST and how to engage, please go to globalpst.org and click on the Get Involved tab. Further information on ESIG can be found at esig.energy. Next, I'd like to go over a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, all the lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. For the Q&A, we use the Slido platform at slido.com. You need to open a browser window, go to slido.com, and enter eSig30, eSig30, as the event code. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the questions on Slido, to allow you to cast a vote to help prioritize the questions submitted. We plan to save about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end and then wrap it up at the top of the hour. An email with a link will be provided once the video file has been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar, but please don't be afraid to ask your questions through Slido. Okay, so today our webinar is gonna cover Project Edge a DER marketplace demonstration whose primary intent is to identify capabilities that can be replicated at scale across the national electricity market in Australia. As you know, with FERC Order 2222 in this country and similar initiatives underway in other countries around the world, there's global interest in the integration of DER into the electricity markets. AMO, along with its project partners, Osnet Services and Mundo, with financial support from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, or ARENA, is leading the charge in Australia. Today's webinar will feature Nick Reagan, business lead for Project Edge at AMO, John Thunison, Project Edge lead for Osnet Services, and Anouk Nambiar, program manager for distributed energy at Osnet Services. Nick, John, and Anoop all have significant background and experience in the Australian energy industry, and I'm very pleased to have them here with us today. The webinar today will provide an overview of the project, a better understanding of the key research questions being addressed, and the learnings to date. The questions address customer needs, alignment to the national electricity objectives, wholesale market integration capability, and local network services requirements. Additional topics <clears throat> include operation within dynamic operating envelopes, how to efficiently exchange data at scale, and the roles and responsibility of each of the actors within the DER marketplace. Okay, just a short reminder once again to use Slido at slido.com with the event code of ESIG30 to ask your questions. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Nick, 
I will now turn it over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Um, can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you see the slides? Yes, to all three. We see you, we hear you, and we see the slides. So we're ready Excellent. to go. Excellent. Love it. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks to you and Ryan for uh, to, for having us uh, in today's session. So welcome everybody. Um, Charlie did a great job of um, of summarising the project there. So um, I'll hope to get through our intro slides pretty quick. Um, we're here today just to give you a bit of a flavour of what Project EDGE is and what we're doing um, and what we're seeking to learn. Our aim is really just to whet your appetite, so to speak, so that we can come back next year uh, with a whole lot of um, findings after the, the project's finished uh, and get into some, some more detailed discussion there. Um, and hopefully what we're learning, as Charlie alluded to, uh, what we're learning here in Australia could uh, be translatable to other jurisdictions in the world, which are, are, are grappling with the challenges of integrating DER. Um, so we'll try and get through our content um, at a reasonably high level, just to give you that intro uh, and, and allow enough time for questions. So uh, this project's funded, uh, has, is supported by funding from ARENA as part of ARENA's Advancing Renewables Program. The views expressed herein are not necessarily the views of the Australian Government, and the Australian Government does not accept responsibility for any information or advice contained herein. So I don't think I need to reintroduce myself. Thanks, Charlie. So as Charlie uh, said at the top there, Project EDGE is, is uh, testing a, a proof of concept scale DR marketplace. Um, so it's to enable the efficient integration of DER to provide services uh, at both a wholesale energy level, so that's the spot market here in, in Australia, uh, but also local network support services to alleviate um, distribution network constraints or within distribution limits. Uh, and, and I guess what we haven't written there, but is really important is this is all an off-market trial. So we're not hooked into the real live um, systems that we use to run the Australian power markets. We've got our nice little um, experimental sandbox on the side, but it is a practical trial. So we are running this uh, with field tests. Real customers DR will be used um, to provide services. It's also going to be capped because it's in practice uh, and not part of the live energy markets at around a thousand customers, just so we don't start interfering with live markets. Um, so that's about 10 megawatts of capacity. But whilst it's at that smaller scale, the whole purpose of EDGE is to test concepts that we think can be efficient and scalable in integrating DR into our power system and markets. Uh, and that's really, as we've got there, um, to serve our target outcome, which is building up an evidence base to inform um, quite a large um, body of reform that's going on in Australia at the moment called the um, post 2025 reforms. And that's really preparing um, Australia's um, power system and markets for uh, the decentralization and decarbonization that's happening at the moment with a lot of you know inverter based resources uh, coming in and, and synchronous machines uh, exiting. And where Project EDGE fits into that overall reform is really focusing on um, informing and shaping that um, DR integration pathway so that it's efficient, but it benefits all consumers, not just those that own the DR. So it's about optimizing whole of system cost. And I think just one other thing, if you're familiar with Australia's um, or AMO's integrated system plan, if you look into that, that's the kind of scale that we're thinking about. Um, it's by 2050, hundreds of gigawatts of behind the meter resources, um, you know, in, in our system here. So that's the kind of scale we're thinking of when we say, is it efficient? Is it scalable? And something, just the last thing to mention there with that body of evidence, it's not just a um, body of evidence or research outcomes against hypotheses. We've also got Deloitte Access Economics doing a cost benefit analysis to help us um, put some dollars around that and say, oh, okay, something works, but under what circumstances does it make financial sense for all consumers? 
So this is a quite a big collaborative project. You've got see the um, project partners that are here today with AMO leading the project, Osnet as the DSO and Mondo as our initial aggregator. We've got a range of technology partners helping us build the systems that we need to um, undertake the trial there. You might, you might recognize some of those names on the left. Uh, and on the right, we've got uh, a range of other supporting partners, um, some academic helping us um, with our research plan, but also doing some of the research. As I mentioned, Deloitte Access Economics, we've got EY in there helping us share this knowledge, um, both here and hopefully internationally. And then uh, NAUS Group is our independent project manager. So, what does the DR marketplace in Project Edge look like? Uh, and it isn't just a doodle on a page. Um, we this is a conceptual view of I guess what our marketplace looks like, uh, and and the functions that are within it. Where does it come from? Is probably the first question. So, seeing the top left of that screen, um, we've. If you're familiar with Open Energy Networks, there's a, there's a process done in the UK. We had a similar cross-industry project here in which we had um, the electricity networks working with AEMO to basically come up with a model of how can we work together to best um, operate in a world that, operate in a future world that is you know, a high DR world. And so through that process, uh, I guess a preferred model was landed landed on called the hybrid model, and that's one in which um, AMO and then the DSOs sort of share responsibility and work together um, to to facilitate DR's integration uh, and provision of services. So, the one important thing on that in the hybrid model is that the way we think about it is. This marketplace isn't just one big platform. It's not something like a Death Star that just does all of the functions that you need in one spot. We really think about it as a, more of a technology ecosystem. And so it's really a collection of those systems and capabilities that each of the market actors um, develop. You know, AMO being the market operator, DSOs managing their networks and aggregators representing customers that come together um, and integrate cohesively to be able to operate that world. So it's it's really about how do you bring those pieces together, not about building one big uh, platform to do that. So it's organized into three function sets, wholesale integration, data exchange, and local services. We'll get into those um, in a bit more detail later on. But I think just to cover off um, the roles and responsibilities, uh, the hypothesis um, for the hybrid model and in Project Edge is that market actors should play a role that's as close to the current role, uh, the current role that they have now, um, just to avoid unnecessary spend in building capability that's um, totally new. So AMO pretty much just plays its current role in as market operator in Project Edge. We receive bids from aggregated DER. Uh, we are conscious of distribution network constraints, uh, and we we clear and dispatch um, at those resources to provide energy services. And that's pretty much what that first wholesale service, wholesale integration function in the light blue relates to. Uh, the second one that AMOs has a big hand in is the data exchange. So we'll get into it a bit later, but our hypothesis there is basically um, an efficient way to scale data exchange is to use a hub rather than many point-to-point -point integrations. And so AMO is hosting that in Project Edge and we'll have bids, dynamic operating envelopes, all our transactions will flow through that. John, I think, do you want to talk to the DSO role in Project Edge? Yeah, very briefly. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, and I'm hoping everybody can hear me. So uh, Osnet Services is the, is the local distribution system sort of service provider, and we take on the role of the DSO. I mean, principally, there are two main areas for us here. The one is uh, to enable the DER marketplace through the operating envelope. So it's effectively allocating or assigning uh, levels of network capacity access, um, available capacity for DER to participate in the market. So uh, that's operating envelopes that you can see in the white in the middle of the, of this, and, and I'll go into that a bit later. 
and then the 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 other main function for the DSO is actually to um, to sort of test out the provision of local services using DR that is you know behind the meter so to speak a lot of it and and some of it in front of the meter but certainly you know exploring that marketplace where local services network services can be provided by DR so that's the that's the sort of function for us Anup I might hand over to you to talk about the aggregator um, um so from the one of the key aspects of this this uh, trial is to make sure it doesn't turn out to be just a technical feasibility study so um real customers real involvement um you know real assessment of um, customer preferences and and um uh, insights and such which we, again we'll touch on a bit later um it, it, it's a is a central piece so um, here, to begin with, we have a, a one aggregator, Mondo, uh, representing um, a, a number of customers that increase through phases. Um, and uh, as part of this trial, there's been a build out of systems and devices to um, uh, provide visibility to those customers and control their devices. Um, and obviously, because of the voluntary market, uh, there's been a, a great deal of effort into uh, customer acquisition, education, and signing up customers to uh, be part of this. So that's been the aggregator role. Um, and uh, as Nick said, uh, Mondo is the initial one, but the intention is to have um, at least two more uh, through the course of the remainder of the project. Uh, and that's really to make sure what we're building is not a, a you know one-off thing. Um, that we'll be, the trial has uh, as much credibility as we can give it. Thanks, back to you, Nick. Thanks, Nope. So I won't dwell on this too much. I think we've talked about most of the key points. Um, where are we now? We're in our third phase of our five-phase project. Um, essentially, we've established the project, developed our um, the MVP capability late last year. Um, something I forgot to mention at the top, but there's a slide in the back here, is there's a link to AMO's webpage that has a whole raft of more detailed information about the project. Uh, it's got other recorded webinars, it's got lessons learned reports, our research plan, our data specs, um, a recorded showcase of our MVP. So if you're really curious, you can go there to find out about all the detail that we just don't have time to get in today. So that's phase two. In phase three, we've essentially been finishing off our tools that we need to run the operational trial, which starts on the 1st of May. Um, what you can expect in phase three uh, is also a, a range of knowledge sharing deliverables um, posted up on the website there. So we've got a couple of quite large reports um, about what we've found to date in the project, more on its the detail of its design and the challenges we foresee um, the Australian energy market having to actually um, face into throughout the next few years, and which Project Edge will be able to provide some evidence to support that sort of cross-industry decision-making. Um, so they'll come in shortly after April, if you're interested, they'll be on the website. Um, so the next two phases really are the operational trials. So that runs 1st of May to the end of March in 23. Uh, and that's, we'll start out with trialing uh, with just Mondo uh, and, and continued knowledge sharing throughout. Uh, but once we get to the 1st of September, we'll have our additional two aggregators uh, onboarded and, and operating in the market with their customers as well. Uh, and so there's a range of knowledge sharing that will, will be dropped throughout that. Uh, but all of those large reports like the CB, uh, cost benefit analysis will be coming at the end there early next year. Okay, so onto just a little bit about our research plan. As I mentioned, we've published that. You, it's it's all public, you're able to look at that uh, in a bit more detail if you're interested. We'll just try to give you a bit of a, a flavour as to what we're actually looking into in the project. And before we do, or we get into the questions, probably just a few key points on how did we arrive at those questions. Uh, and so this was really done through an industry uh, or a collaborative approach, uh, but also an iterative approach. And we're really fortunate to be supported by the University of Melbourne uh, in Australia in developing up these research questions and the research plan. Um, we 
aren't necessarily day by day researchers. And so having their expertise on how you craft questions, how you craft hypotheses, um, how you structure your test cases and and data analysis plans to actually um, answer questions and generate an evidence base that is robust, that is defensible, um, was really important. And it's important because industry reform is relying on this evidence to help you know, guide it. Um, so we're really fortunate to have the university involved there. Um, the only bit I'll probably elaborate on is we started broad, we narrowed in with um, the university's expertise, um, but also with a lot of stakeholder engagement, some targeted one-on-ones with peak bodies and, um, uh, and, and key stakeholders, but to deep dive on different areas, but also we have some dedicated forums for our project and we also got broad input across the industry. So what we might do now is, is get into the questions. So these are seven higher level questions that all have hypotheses and associated activities underneath them. So they're meant to capture, I guess, an element of the project and what we're looking into and the hypotheses get a bit more specific and they're all in that publicly available research plan. Um, you'll see there um, the function sets we talked about earlier. We've color coded them with the questions just so you can kind of see where they fit in. Uh, and so what we'll do now is just run through not in a huge amount of detail, but just give you a flavor of what the questions are actually seeking to to answer um, before we move on. So Anoop, did you want to talk to question one? Yeah, just briefly. Um, again, as I was saying earlier, we certainly don't want this trial to be a technical feasibility piece around how to dynamically manage operating envelopes and optimize um, uh, or run op optimization. Uh, functions it, it had to involve customers. So when we're looking at these questions, what do we want to answer? The first one we decided to start with is looking at the customer. What does a customer's invested in DER want? What, what are they looking for? So we've said that as our first and, and uh, question. Um, and um, for the next uh, three, uh, I might just pass it to uh, back to you. Is, is that back to you, Nick? Yeah, I, I can go. I'll go. Um... I'll do the the orange and dark blue, and then John can do the light blue. So we've got a um, yeah a dedicated question for customers, um, and that's supported by a dedicated um, customer insight study by Deakin University here in Australia. Um, we also have a dedicated cost benefit analysis question in question two, and I won't read them out for you, but essentially what we're getting Deloitte Access Economics to look into is. Um, the marketplace that we're, we're testing, and we'll get into the progressions later, but is, is essentially there are a range of models which are progressing from simple to more complex, but hopefully more efficient. And so what we're looking for that's key out of that cost benefit analysis is not just um, how do the dollars stack up, but when do the dollars stack up? What we want to know from them is as DR penetration increases and concentration in networks increases, when does it make sense to move from a simplified model to a more complicated but probably costly model? These are the sorts of things we want to be able to give to our rule makers um, and decision makers to say, you know, where we have a simplified model that potentially works for 10 years and only when DR penetration gets to a certain point, then we need to, we can justify um, investing in a more sophisticated system. So it should actually help with a bit of decision making off the back of the research we're doing. The next question I'll talk to is just that wholesale integration one. So that's really um, a lot of the things AMO is, is concerned with. There's um, how do you get visibility of DR that's behind the meter? We don't have very good visibility of it now. We're also interested in how fleets of um, aggregated DR behind the, behind the meter um, can actually perform. Uh, can they meet dispatch targets? How do they ramp on their way to meeting a dispatch target? Can they stay within their dynamic operating envelopes? Um, and can an aggregator provide a wholesale service as well as a local service at the same time? Um, that's the, the sort of things we're interested in in question four. Question six on efficient data exchange. Um, I, I think I mentioned it at the top. Uh, the, 
the core hypothesis there is that with um, sort of DR being integrated into power system and markets, we have a few new use cases um, that, that, you know, in the way of dynamic operating envelopes, uh, they need to flow from DSOs to aggregators to then operate within. Um, at the moment, that is pretty much being done in a point-to-point -point fashion because there's no alternative, and that makes sense. Um, so one um, DSO will just integrate directly with, say, say there's three aggregators three times uh, and send dynamic operating envelopes out that way. Um, we're hypothesizing that it's more efficient uh, as we scale to have all of those integration points come into a data hub um, so that anyone on the hub can trust that anyone else on the hub is who they say they are and that, say in that use case, um, networks can just send their dynamic operating envelopes to the hub by one integration and that can be uh, fanned out to the rightful aggregators. The other part of that efficient data exchange is we're operating this marketplace over public internet. And so all the outages and inaccuracies of data and other shortfalls of public internet, uh, we're seeking to understand those so that we can basically understand how to work around that for for a, a, a world where you've got a whole lot of DR that is going to be um, operated through potentially customers Home internet. Um, John, did you want to talk to the the light blue questions there? Yeah, happy to. Um, so that first one there is uh, question three, which is around the operating envelope design. We are in the project exploring multiple types of you know operating envelope designs, and uh, and looking at how does that impact the you know efficiency uh, of allocating network capacity, but also we're looking at the the the, the context of the combination of you know, wholesale energy provision as well as local service provision. So that's, you know, and you can imagine quite a lot of um, questions around the operating envelope design. Local services, local network services. Look, we, we, we do use DR for, for services now, but, but it's large scale and, and it's not really a marketplace. It's largely bilateral contracts. But what we're exploring here is, you know, how, how, how efficient is it or how, you know, effective and efficient is it uh, that if you can use that in a more marketplace style but also you know lots and lots of small scale uh, der so behind the meter type stuff and that's that you know a lot of these questions are really out there you know how reliable can you get it uh, is it always going to be dependable those sorts of things so and and in a marketplace type of, and i'll talk more about that later uh, the last one there research question seven is about you know the investment in other words how much investment should um, networks businesses be putting into, you know, this sort of thing where, you know, to enable DER within the marketplace? And one of the sort of uh, context or one of the sort of the hypothesis we're testing here is, you know, can, can you actually use network levers in a way that really, uh, uh, you know, uh, accelerate or, or uh, enlarge uh, the ability for DER to, to uh, to play a role in the in the in the you know energy supply ecosystem, so that's uh, that's an exciting thing for us because we, we you know we we don't do a lot of that now, and that is something we're really keen to explore. So Nick, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, thanks, John. <clears throat> and I think just for um, any of the the data nuts out there um, who are wondering, we're running our market in line with how the the NEM in the east coast of Australia runs now. <clears throat> so it's a five minute market. Um, we're collecting quite a broad range of data. There's a lot of standing data. We'll be getting portfolio, so aggregated DR portfolio level forecasts and telemetry. We'll be getting separation of um, what is just the controllable resource going to do and, and, and what was the telemetry for that, but also um, the movement of energy through the through our meters that connect um, those sites to the grid. Um, and yeah, the, we're getting that at, a, at an aggregated portfolio level, but we're also for a desktop study um, and, and not necessarily intended to become a feature of, a, of the real marketplace, but we're also going to get site level um, forecasts and telemetry. Um, so quite a broad range of data there, and I think that'll give us some really rich insights to come back to this forum 
next year and, and share. So we've talked about research questions and we've talked about how it informs reform. What are we going to do with that? And, and this is just to give you a little bit of an idea of, I guess, um, the mechanics we've set up in the project to take what we're doing um, and bring that evidence base into the reform that's going on. So just quickly, here these four boxes really represent the process we're going through over the life of the project. We've worked up our research plan, we've designed out our marketplace and continue to design some of the more complex, sophisticated features. Um, as I said, 1st of May, we'll actually start operating it um, in the field. And then we'll, we'll um, when we finish doing that, we'll have all of our uh, evidence and, and reports and uh, written and, and be able to be shared. But the important thing here is we've, we've got a really structured stakeholder engagement program that is feeding input and feedback into the project through all of these um, all of these stages, not just when we're getting evidence from doing the trials, but also into our research plan, into how we design out the specifics of the functions that we're operating. And through that, we're able to share what we're learning and seeing and doing into reform right now before we've even started doing the operational trial. Um, you know, we've, for some of these um, reforms, you know, before they've started to get going in earnest, we've actually been able to think deeply about some of the mechanics that have been proposed um, or, or to raise issues or challenges that we can foresee from actually trying to do it from starting 1st of May uh, before the whole um, reform process has gone through. So that's been really valuable so far. Um, and as we get into the operational trial, we'll be able to then support even more with actual hard evidence from doing it. Um, so it's been really exciting to actually be able to support reform right from the start before we even have the operational trial running. Okay. So we mentioned the function sets at the top. That was that conceptual diagram with a, a light blue, a dark blue and a green function set. Um, what we wanted to do now is take you through a bit more of a look under the hood about what's involved in each of those. Um, it won't be exhaustive, but it should give you a bit more of an idea. So the first one I'll take you through is the wholesale integration function. Uh, and if you remember, that was all about how do, how do bids um, and constraint, can constraints get, um, uh, get used to clear and dispatch um, aggregators of um, a fleet of DR resources. So. What we have in Project Edge, and I think I mentioned it when I was talking about the cost benefit analysis, is we have a few progressions in our operating models. So you see here, um, we've got a few horizons, well, we've got five horizons here. Um, and, and these are plotted along an efficiency and cost or complexity um, uh, graph. And so what we're looking to test in our operating models is really there's three. There's a basic version, a more um, bid optimized version that has, um, you know, sort of more intraday updates. Uh, and then in a desktop sense, a more of a nodal constraints model. Um, I think the main thing to call out here, and we'll get into the each of the elements um, as we go, but each of these target operating models have a constraints element, so that's dynamic operating envelopes, and then there's a an element of how does the market operator get visibility um, through the bidding and the forecasting. So on the bidding progression, um, we've got rule changes going on in Australia at the moment that are all about how do you get um, visibility of what a, a DR portfolio is is doing at any point in time it's really hard if not impossible to forecast price responsive um, dr um, we found through other trials that we haven't been able to do that yet and so the rule change is working out how do you get some of that visibility but how do you do it in a way that 
gives participants somewhat of a smooth pathway from providing a bit of visibility, but not having to take on the full risk of being in um, and exposed to the spot market we have here. So we're testing progressions in that sense. So our, our horizon two on bidding really just provides some forecasts um, and telemetry, um, but with no obligation to actually follow a dispatch instruction. The the second progression or our third horizon on this diagram is a self dispatch uh, model, and so that's where um, the forecasting is simplified. You just give give one number for your fleet every five minutes, uh, and you are a price taker, and so you you have a dispatch instruction to follow, uh, but you, you you don't have to have the sophistication needed for that final fourth horizon, which is uh, what we call scheduled bidding. So you've got 20 price bands um, that you can use to bid uh, and then dispatch instructions that you need to follow. So that's really that path what we want participants to be able to um, to go on. And I think the important part there for us is it can't be onerous, otherwise we're not going to get um, DR aggregators actually providing us the visibility we need. And so it's while this is all kind of a little nascent, um, it's it's about how do you support and incentivize getting that visibility rather than um, coming down with penalties. That's a hypothesis, at least for now. John, did you want to talk through the operating envelopes? Uh, yes, please. That's great. Uh, so I see a, a, a fair few questions in the slider around operating envelopes. So just very briefly, I mean, for in, in our context here, I mean, we see the operating envelopes as providing the operational playing field for the connected DR. And it's essentially the boundaries within which that DR must operate to keep the electricity supply sort of network safe and secure. Um, and of course, I mean, this is reflective of this growing need to for networks to evolve to a more dynamic method of allocating and managing network capacity. And, and we need that to facilitate the bi-directional energy flows and to increase customer DER hosting capacity. So as I said earlier in EDGE, we're exploring a number of ways to, to, to calculate and to allocate these operating envelopes. Um, and the idea is to build evidence that would support what is the most cost-effective solution that can scale in future and, and what might be the most widely accepted or stakeholder supported allocation of network capacity to, to customer DER. So as you can see on the slide, you know, we, we're looking at different levels of complexity uh, in, in, the, in the calculation. Uh, and we're also looking at different allocation methods. Uh, and I see, I mean, one of the questions was around fairness and efficiency. Well, where is that balance point? You know, we, we, we've got lots of We've got lots of stakeholders who are, who are plugging away on the fairness one and all well and good, but recognize there's always a trade off uh, when you go down a fairness pathway, uh, you lose efficiency. So even our early uh, results from the, 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 you know, we're not yet in the operational part of the trial, but the, the university is well proven. There's a couple of papers out there from Melbourne University as to how this plays out. So the three allocation uh, obje objective functions, if you like, we're using is maximizing services or exports in this case, uh, equal allocation or a, some sort of a weighting on that allocation. So that's a bit of a, 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 a summary of, of what we're doing with the operating envelope design. Nick, if you want to move us on to the local services, I'm just conscious of time because we, we're running tight here. Uh, I'll just very briefly uh, describe what we're doing in the local service. So this is essentially an, an, an exchange, a local service exchange. And, uh, and this slide shows you the, the roles. It's principally between the aggregator and the distribution system operator. We use, as Nick said earlier on, the, 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 the edge of the eco, the, that technology ecosystem uh, to, 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 to move between the two and the data exchange hub. But we basically go through a, a number of processes where we're actually defining uh, service needs. Uh, and, and, and this is in a standard, or the intention here is to arrive at a standardized uh, local services type exchange. So, you know, we have the definition of the characteristics, uh, enrollment, uh, and then you get into an engaged stage where, okay, uh, there's, there's, there's both aggregators and the DSO are, are effectively uh, arriving at a point where, yes, they can establish a sort of contract. 
And then it's about when the need arrives is actually the delivery of those services. So effectively dispatch and delivery of those services, a verification and a reporting on that. The way that we've, if you move on to the next slide, the way that we've we've sort of structured the services that we're testing, uh, Nick, next slide, yeah. Uh, two ca two main categories: demand increase or reduction, or voltage. But in the in but in each case, we're looking at defining the services around a level of firmness. So, in other words, if you think about a, a typical capex uh, case for a, for a networks business. You know, it's determined well in advance. We actually need a high level of, of, of determinism about the solution because it's if it's going to be a non network solution, we need to be sure the service is going to be provided. So there's your high firmness uh, service case. Medium firmness is linked to an operational planning type use case. So a couple of days out, you your control center has recognized, hey, we, 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 we've got an event coming up and we may need some support. Low firmness is on the day when things haven't gone quite to plan uh, to have access to sort of spontaneous operational support using DR. So that's the way we've de 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 defined it or de classified it. And, and those are the services we're running with. The next slide shows uh, the same thing on voltage. Uh, and they're typically, you know, the networks aspect of this is more related to high firmness, where we know there's a problem with voltages. And we need to have a, you know, a sustained uh, solution to that. And, and we're using, you know, reactive support from DER for that. So that's, and, and that's via a service. So we're testing out that medium and low firmness in this particular context is more about, uh, you know, the beneficiary of those services are, are more than market and the aggregator. So, so, you know, if an aggregator wants to uh, in, enable more, um, more active participation in the market. There's a possibility that they can that they can um, self help and also uh, perhaps use uh, the, the marketplace for for uh, a voltage management service to, to to enable them to be more active in the market. So that's basically what I'd like to cover on the local services. Nick, back to you. Thanks, John. <clears throat> um, and just on the data exchange function set really quickly, I think I've already talked a little bit about this, but just to give it some pictures um, so it, it makes a little more sense. Uh, I talked earlier about how um, AMO's forecasting, you know, over 100 gigawatts of um, of capacity in the distribution network. Um, what underlies this, though, as probably a lot of people on the call uh, would be able to, uh, would be familiar with, is uh, there's a big data exchange element to integrating that amount of um, you know DR into system and markets, and so this is an intentionally messy slide to try and convey that. Uh, so, what our research question six and our data exchange um, uh, function sets all about is how do you, in a future where you've got you know a range of services at the wholesale uh, level, but also many. Uh, we've got 13 in this part of Australia, 13 distribution networks or, or DSOs um, buying um, uh, or, or buying services through their local services exchanges um, with, you know, potentially hundreds of aggregators and millions of devices. How does that data exchange work? That's got a few basic challenges that that we're um, looking into, like establishing and maintaining the relationships between those entities and the devices and the services that they can provide and are enrolled for. Um, there's just the scaling for the volume of exchanging that data um, and then, you know, managing the credentials of all of those agents. Um, so that's what we're looking to address or at least shine some light on in that research question six. Um, I think one of the key points being that, um, or oh, I might just get into that now. So the, this is essentially a visual representation of our hypothesis. Rather than if you see this web of point to point integrations, we're operating a data exchange hub. And the important point there is that you can leverage things like identity access management, the process can be done for the hub, so it doesn't need to be replicated for other, uh, for everybody who's individually connected to the hub. Um, probably the other thing to mention there is we're thinking that can foster um, the innovation of services. So if you have 
people are connected or entities connected to the hub that can trust each other. Um, we might have more scalable exchange of dynamic operating envelopes, but we may also have new services that can arise like, uh, for example, retailers here, if they're exposed to negative spot prices, could put a call out for, um, for aggregators to actually limit the amount of energy that their DR or DR in their portfolios are exporting uh, to save them or as somewhat of a physical hedge against negative um, spot prices, which they actually have to pay for the customers generating and exporting into the grid. So we think it allows for innovation as well as efficiency in data exchange. Uh, Anoop, over to you. Oh, we got here. Um, thanks. We'll, we'll make make this fairly fairly quick, and and so we allow enough time for Q and A. And uh, next slide, please, uh, please. Uh, next, so again, just looking at the customer side of this, just to give you a sense of how we've gone about making this a you know as real trial. So uh, as we said earlier, we expect to have um, uh, at least three aggregators representing customers in the trial market. Um, the initial customer, uh, big button aggregator is Monda and, um, and what you see on the right there is sort of how Monda's planned out, uh, the acquisition of customers for this trial. Um, and the intention is to, you know, have the other aggregators come on board and extend the customer numbers to in the limits uh, around thousand limit that um, Nick was speaking about. So just just quickly, um, there's a, the Hume region, which is uh, sort of northwest uh, Victoria, the, the state we're in, um, is is known for their renewable sort of uh, pioneering. So there's a lot of people there in the community really excited about renewable energy, uh, sustainability, and that sort of thing. So we we really relying on their goodwill and, and prior participation in other trials to, to build our customer base. And so I won't go through the detail, but there is, we phased it out, uh, the customer acquisition activities over three phases, um, starting with the core, you know, the bleeding edge people, and then extending to those who hopefully will be convinced of the value of the trial. Just quickly from an aggregator perspective for this uh, trial, um, broadly the sort of three areas we've, we've focused on and the, the key one there is customer acquisition. So there's been a lot of activity and, and learnings out of it and that relates to uh, you know, how to engage customers, how to educate them because the, the knowledge, uh, the understanding of how the electricity market works and how all these things uh, fit together it isn't necessarily uniform. So um, what we've done is work closely with the community. We have people in those communities. So, you know, um, uh, doing town halls and those sort of things is just uh, building trust and educating. And then incentives. So this is not a, we don't have real settlements in this trial. And I think there was a question about this possibly in the, the slide though. So what we're doing is we, we do want to simulate what the incentives might be. Um, but we, because there's no real settlements, um, the incentives are uh, relatively static. So we've budgeted for uh, you know, the trial customers be paid based on participation um, and not, uh, you know, how, how a proper settled market might um, extend that uh, market value to customers. So that's what we're calling out. The other part of it is the actual platform capability. So while we, we've been striving to make sure that um, barriers to entry are, you know, that, that we identify are kept low, uh, whether it's systems or market arrangements, there is some uh, technical capability, obviously, that we require. So customers are represented solely by the aggregator. So the aggregator needs to be able to control and monitor customer sites and then be able to transmit that in a market sense uh, via the hub uh, to the other participants. So building out that, so I've just not uh, a few key features. So, you know, capacity forecasting, market control, obviously, and the ability to dispatch. I think there was, again, a question in Slido about dispatch. So dispatch is we try to mimic what uh, or learn from what the national electricity market currently does. And, and um, with that as a basis, the aggregator upon receiving a dispatch instruction from the market operator will need to disaggregate that um, into the DER fleet. So that's a capability we've been working on. And obviously customer UI, we don't, we want to make sure customers are aware and can see what's happening because, uh, you know, um, while some people might want to set and forget, uh, others are interested, uh, much more interested about how their equipment is being used. And even things like, you know, ha having a representation of um, 
the carbon uh, they have helped take out of the environment, for example, uh, uh, out of the atmosphere. And finally, um, just touching on customer insights. So we are having, uh, you know, we've uh, got a university working with us uh, and consultants to help understand um, through surveys and um, uh, sort of customer intending and prospective cust uh, 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 signed up customer um, interactions, understand uh, sort of perceptions, uh, needs, the, the aspect of social license, and also what might be blockers for customers, um, you know, participating in a, in a market arrangement like that, uh, like the one we are trialing with the DEI investments. Um, I'll just quickly go to the next slide if I could. Um, so the university we're collaborating with is, is Lincoln University. Uh, you have done a fair bit of work in the space uh, here in, in, in Victoria and, and, and across Australia really. Um, so four aspects to how we're trying to um, understand or, or gather customer insights. So uh, the first thing is literature review. I mean, this is not new. You know, a couple of people in Slido pointed out how this is so similar to what's happening in Ontario. And, and I'm sure that there, you know, there, there are trials around the world which are, uh, you know, have some or many aspects of what we're trying to do. So we don't want to waste any of that. So, and, and this is in the context of customer insights, but that's probably a, a broader comment as well. So literature review, building on what's already been done and understood, and then actual surveys. So uh, the initial set was completed late last year across uh, residential and uh, commercial and, and uh, local government. Um, uh, but the survey is not just for, you know, to, to try and avoid um, the sort of self-selection uh, sampling error, you know, make sure we include people who didn't participate as well as people who did. Um, and and then uh, there is a further step to extend that, um, a, a, you know, over the remainder of the project to uh, more uh, individuals and in hopefully more varied areas. So as I said, uh, this project was kicked off in an area where they're already excited about the uh, we want to make sure we're not, you know, we're not biasing our findings because uh, when you go into an urban area, people might be uh, have very different uh, views on the ER and and also limitations. If you're living in a, uh, you know, in an apartment building, your views on what uh, the ER could do for you might be very different to someone out there in their um, self-sufficient, um, you know, zero carbon house they build with their uh, their own hands. So we want to make sure we, we cover that that spectrum. We don't, you know, we don't fall into any of those traps. And I'll just quickly go to the the next one, um, Nick. If I could, next slide. And and yeah, this is a flavor of what we're finding. It, 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 not, nothing hugely surprising. Uh, the, the the cohort we uh, or deacons uh, sort of work with today, um, uh, yeah, they're pioneers. So they're not. When you talk to them about uh, financial incentives, uh, you know, energy trading, that's not what, why they get into you know, the spending money on solar and battery. Um, they want to do the right thing by the environment. They want to do the right thing by the community. And then and, um, and they want, and, and quite often, because in the regional areas, they're also worried about um, uh, energy resilience. So, you know, things like bushfire and, and sort of uh climate events uh islanding them for example that's what initially drives them so what you know what we don't sort of understand is how do you extend that to then say well you know uh, work with an aggregate or, or a market participant to uh you know extend your services across the grid and and, and that um yeah and, and this is what that uh, the benefits that might come from it would look like uh, but right now, the initial perception is that yeah, yeah, energy trading is still, you know, they don't quite get it. They don't understand why a, a DNSP or an energy company might want to, uh, you know, control their assets. And, and you know, Nick made the, uh, the comment about the Death Star. Uh, you know, it's certainly not the image we want to portray in any others, right? It's not about command and control. It's about participation and, and um, common value and community value, uh, that sort of thing. So. Initial findings, and similarly with the CNI, it's a commercial and industrial and local government. For them, it's you know, as you might imagine, the so the blockers are more purely financial. You know, what's the payback period? Uh, what's the assured return? Uh, what's the opportunity cost if they spend on DER and and this sort of participation? Or what are they missing out on? You know, and and also, you know, it, quite often it, it, in in organisations, what you need is some you know, hopefully at the CEO or a director level. 
uh, champions who who can uh, you know you can take it beyond the the numbers because the numbers are still early. It's very hard to say what the pay, you know the actual payback might be. So you need some champions in there uh, to help um, you know make something like this a reality. So some initial findings, and uh, I think back to you, Nick. Yeah, back to me and really back to Charlie um, for Q and A. Um, I'll just. I think these slides are going out, Charlie. So there, there are links um, for everybody there to find more information. They will be. They'll be posted uh, within a couple of days. So thanks, guys. Right. Uh, very fascinating experiment that you're conducting there, and a lot of very interesting insights you're you're gaining. Uh, let me start off with one sort of general level question before I jump into the, the Slido. And I noticed that this was all being done in uh, in Victoria. 10 megawatts of assets in Victoria. I'm just curious with, with South Australia, which has such a high rate of growth of DER and already high high levels. Uh, how how easily do you see transferring the insights and the results of what you're doing in Victoria to to the um, South Australia region? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's one we get quite a lot actually. Um, so. Yeah. Um, what we so a big part of the project, as you might have might have seen, is is stakeholder engagement, and so we've we've got um, so the South Australian networks and 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 government that we're talking to as part of inputting into what we're designing and what we're testing and what we're researching to ensure that it can um, it can be implemented in other jurisdictions, including South Australia, um, and so. That's really, I guess, how we're covering that off. Um, one challenge we do have is around um, penetration of smart meters in Victoria. We're very fortunate to have almost full penetration of smart meters, where other jurisdictions in Australia we don't. Um, and and so the way we're overcoming that is looking at what kind of behind the meter monitoring devices might we need, um, but also um, the way the industry is looking to go is if you're installing DR now um, and you you basically need to have a smart meter come along with that. So um, there's some of the ways, mainly just for that stakeholder engagement and working it out together that we're making sure that um, what we find here can be sort of rolled out across jurisdictions. But the important thing is the concepts we're testing here that are part of the reforms um, going on, you know, aren't going to happen overnight there'll be quite a lot of detail to work out um to to make them a reality um i don't know if john or anoop did you have anything you wanted to add to that uh, very, very, question? Briefly, uh, very briefly the the uh, you know we we work quite closely with the south south australian uh, networks business we've got a, another joint trial around flexible exports so charlie the, the the you know they are they're on a journey and they've had to they've had to fast track because of the levels of behind the meter uh dr and 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 so that's what you would have seen internationally they kind of run uh, so they've had to sort of take not necessarily a market-based approach at the moment but it's more about how do they how do they manage this this rather large dr penetration so and they're doing it that you know they're moving towards a more dynamic way of of, of governing the the access to the network of, of the behind the meter stuff but uh certainly as nick says you know the the uh the concepts we're testing here would would provide a a a, a more mature uh, over time a more mature arrangement for them and 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 they I mean they are involved in our project as well in terms of the advisory groups and things like that. So. Sure, thank you. Okay, maybe we can uh, get a couple of these uh, high priority questions here from Slido. First, can you clarify the signal that the DER is responding to? Is it price or something else? Sure, I can take that one. So uh, I guess there'll be two signals um, that the aggregator will see and then, you know, obviously decide how based on what capacity they've got in their DR fleet and, and individual agreements they have with their customers, they'll decide how they respond. Um, as Anoop was saying, some customers buy batteries because they, they don't, don't want to be islanded in a bushfire. And so they may have conditions with their aggregator that, hey, you can't you can't use my battery if it's, you know, uh, uh, you must keep it at least half full, for example. Um, and then, then each customer may have a, a different um, 
cost to the aggregator. They may they may be more highly incentivized because of the DR they have. So that feeds into, I guess, the cost of participating in events for an aggregator. So they're going to weigh those things up against two price signals, one being the wholesale um, energy price forecast, which um, you know AMO, AMO do, and um, that's really out sort of 48 hours. Um, so that's the wholesale price signal. The second price signal um, is for the local services that John talked about. So there'll be service needs posted with, um, some of them may have a price on them or they may just be bid on, um, but those are the two price signals that aggregators are gonna be able to see and say, okay, this is the cost of dispatching my fleet. Here's my wholesale market opportunity. Here's my local network support services opportunity. Maybe I can use the same kilowatt to provide both services, and that's how they're going to be able to make a financial decision there. Um, the wholesale price is um, dollars per megawatt hour. Okay. I'm going to take the two questions from Ontario since they're similar. I did basically, first, a comment that there's a very similar project going on in Ontario uh, titled the, the York Region Non Wires Alternative Project, just for your people's information. And then a question from the first one on Ontario. One difference is that DER operating envelopes are reflected in wholesale market offers. Can you please comment? Yeah, I'm happy to sort of just kick in, and then Nick, you can take take it further. But uh, the, the so the, the the way our our environment works is that the operate the the aggregator bids into the market with full knowledge of what their operating envelope is. So the operating envelope doesn't really have a direct association with the market. Bid, the we we you know, but they have to take they have to operate within the operating envelope. So the aggregator who's bidding into the market basically knows what his network access, his available network access is, and he bids within that. Uh, that's the concept that we're applying. Okay. Yeah, that that's right, John. Just to add to that, if I can, Charlie. Um, th so the the aggregator bids constrained. In, with the knowledge of their, their DOEs, something that we're really interested to learn is how do you appropriately enforce that? Uh, an aggregator may be incentivized by a market price hitting the ceiling of $15,000 a megawatt hour um, to breach a dynamic operating envelope at a site level uh, for commercial gain. That could happen. Um, likewise, um, AEMO can't really check whether every single um, site envelope is being bid within when we're when we're sending dispatch instructions. So how you actually ensure that those limits are um are uh, preserved um without just relying on on good faith um that's something that we're we're looking to learn and work out. Okay. I'm gonna to try to squeeze in a few more questions here because we're uh, a little over time but the a related question the first one here is considerations in operating envelope design regarding fairness and equity impacts. <clears throat> Give so, any consideration to that? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, and that's a hot topic for us, Charlie, uh, in, 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 the, in the audience. Uh, the, 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 the rule makers and, 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 and um, the sort of, uh, the, the, um, the sort of customer authorities are very keen to, to to have you know fairness in the in the operating envelope. Um, it's evident at the moment that you know there there is going to be a trade off there. So we we have to consider that there is a separate aspect. I mean, there's a comment at the bottom of that question around um, a DLMP. Is that sort of distribution of local lo, you know locational marginal pricing? I don't know whether that's referring to that at all, but we are exploring some of that in a a DER to network to market sort of interaction, but certainly from an operating envelope design point of view, we are carefully considering in both the sort of fairness and the equity um, uh, objective functions uh, as well as economic efficiency. I mean, our as Nick mentioned earlier, our, our, our sort of our overall objective is an efficiency objective. So how do you deal with fair? Because it's because the world is not fair. So so uh, yeah. Interesting. Good okay. question. Okay. Um, then one here on the inverters. What measurement of response from aggregators and inverters are you testing, particularly related to provision of system services? 
Sure, so I can. Yeah, you, you, you yeah. don't need to be new. I forgot that one. Yeah, so um, it might be different for local network support services um, for John, but for in terms of um, AEMO looking at you know compliance with dispatch instructions for wholesale energy, it's we're really looking at getting uh, telemetry data at a fleet level, uh, and so that's um, a measurement from. Um, two definitions of quantity that I, I sort of touched on earlier. Um, it, the aggregator will have to take measurement at what's going through the connection point to the grid at each site, um, which is through smart meters, but also um, there will be a, a measurement point behind the meter for all of the DR that they have there. So just for the controllable assets. And so with those points aggregated up at sites and then aggregated up into a fleet, that's what we're collecting, those two definitions of quantity uh, at a fleet level. And those measurements are done uh, instantaneously every one minute. Uh, and we're seeking to actually have them transmitted um, over public internet every one minute as well. Um, okay. John, I don't know if, if you had yeah, anything just, to add. Yeah, on the, on the local services, I mean, we are testing the reactive area, the provision of reactive power there. So, and, and how the inverters respond to a combination of providing re reactive power as well as real power. So, and, and we've kind of, we've done a bit of work in that area already, but, and, and so it's, it's crossing between the networks and the, and the aggregators, but it's, but it's, you know, to what extent, what sort of compromise is there when you are, you know, wanting to, you know, provide a reactive power service, but also participate in the market uh, for, for your active power. So th th those are some of the things we're testing. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to take one more question and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. That's the one on uh, blockchain or transactive energy. Anything going on there with uh, blockchain or transactive energy or decentralized peer-to-peer -peer energy trading yeah. technology? I can have a, a go at that one, Charlie. And that's um, someone's obviously knows EWF or or is uh, we're googling our partners earlier. So, um, in so that's something that um, EWF do work with blockchain. Um, in terms of transactive energy and and peer to peer trading, that's not something that we're doing in Project Edge. Um, which element of that uh, we are bringing into the project is decentralization. So that data exchange hub I mentioned earlier, um, we're testing I guess two versions of that. One which is um, centralized, so hosted by say one party like AEMO. Um, that obviously comes with uh, potential cyber risks of, you know, a single point of failure. Um, the alternative we want to test is having some of those elements of the data exchange infrastructure, like the messaging um, bus, be decentralized. And so we'll have a couple of nodes hosting that service um, and, and basically see how that plays out. Um, blockchain's not really a huge feature of that. It's more of an audit trail of what transactions happened and updates to databases were the update. Um, it's, we don't really store any real data on it. So it's a very sort of small role. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I, I wanted to get in as many questions as we could, because there's a lot of good questions out there and a lot of information that was presented and I appreciate everybody hanging in there. We're a little, little over, but Nick, John, Anoop, Really, thanks for a, a very interesting and informative webinar today. I know I learned a few new things and I hope everyone else did as well. And as we discussed earlier, an email will go out once the video file has been posted and we'll get the responses to the unanswered questions posted as quickly as we can. So we appreciate your engagement. And if you'd like to stay engaged, I would invite you to participate in the April webinars and in the upcoming workshops on forecasting and markets and grid forming inverters in Denver, Colorado in June. Those will be in person. Further information on the workshops and all the webinars can be found on our website at esig.energy under events, and you're all invited to attend. Information on all the GPST webinars can also be found at globalpst.org. So again, Nick, John, and Anoop, I wanna thank you for this very timely webinar and thank everyone for your interest. We look forward to seeing you again in the near future. And in the meantime, everyone stay, <clears throat> stay safe, take care, and thanks again for your participation. Okay, bye now. <laughs>